I think I should introduce myself too, not just in the, with those two titles, but also to let you know that I'm not on the registry and nobody in my family is on the registry. And that I got to this issue because I read a book. And the book I read was written by my plumber, Frank. And I don't know about you, I don't expect plumbers to write books. Um, and he'd put a reverse osmosis underneath my kitchen sink, and every year he came back to service it. And one year he happened to mention he was writing a book, and I thought, well, that's nice. I have fr other friends who are writing books. Um, and uh, when one year he came back and told me he finished writing his book, well, that took got my attention, and he said it was published. I was like, wow, that really got my attention. And so I thought it would be a book good plumbing customer and buy a copy of his book. I didn't know what it was about. I really thought it was about plumbing or perhaps fly fishing. Um, but <laughs> when I offered to buy his book, he warned me. He said, this is a difficult book to read. And I said, I'm a lawyer. I've read a lot of difficult books and I have a free weekend coming up. And I had no idea that reading his book was going to change my life. None. And I read his book, which is about his experience on the registry, and I really and truly could not believe that any group of people in our society today are being treated the way that Frank has been treated in his life. And I won't go into the gory details. You can read his book, all right? It's available on Amazon. It's called We're All in This Together. And that book, as I found out, and the challenges that Frank, the plumber, has um, encountered in his life, it's not the worst thing that's happened to a registered sex offender, unfortunately, right? It's bad. I mean, a complete stranger broke into Frank's house when he wasn't there, because, only because he's on the registry and his home address is listed on the Megan's Law website, and he b broke his computer and d damaged other property inside of his house while he's waiting for Frank to come home. And then when Frank did come home, that man tried to murder him. He tried to murder Frank, okay? He had Frank's hammers in his hand, one in each hand, and said, I'm going to kill you, you blankety blink blink blink. I'm trying not to swear this morning, okay? It's early in the day. <laughs> I'm known for having a bit of a potty mouth and I'm trying to reform. So um, the fact is, <laughs> he tried to kill Frank. Okay, with his own hammers. And this was a younger, much larger man than Frank, but Frank is nimble. And he was able to escape from his own home with his life. Okay, that's part of Frank's book. That is what got my attention. That a complete stranger, somebody who'd never met Frank, could be so angry that he would try to kill him. And he almost did. So Frank was damaged, his computer was destroyed, other things happened in that home. But Frank, thankfully, is with us today, and I'm very proud to say that Frank is on our board of directors <laughs> currently. And that Frank also is a plaintiff in 13 lawsuits that I have filed since March of this year. All right, Frank is out there, and he, you know, writing a book about this subject, he put himself, you know, he exposed himself at that point in time. And when we really, as an organization, had difficulty finding plaintiffs, people who had standing to sue, okay, that had standing to sue in these lawsuits, I don't know about in your state, but in my state, people did not want to put their hands up. <clears throat> Even to be John Doe or Jane Doe. I did file a few lawsuits with John and Jane Doe's. But you have to ask the court's permission to be John or Jane Doe. And we did have one experience where a federal court refused to let us use John or Jane Doe. He refused. And because he refused, the case got dismissed because my plaintiffs weren't ready yet. And I don't criticize anybody for not being ready. I don't. I ask people to show up, to stand up, and to speak up. And at first, people thought I was being a little pushy. So I said, OK, let me add this when you're ready because people aren't always ready. Even if you're the family member of, right, a registered citizen, you may not be ready to let your next door neighbor know. How about to let your relatives know, right? You may not be ready to do that. And I would urge you when you are ready to do so, even if you're not in California. 
Okay, so when after we got organized, <laughs> and again, we got incorporated, we applied for tax-exempt status, it's very important, by the way, to have a structural framework. And even the national organization, when I first got involved in it, and I found out they were not incorporated, and they did not have tax-exempt status, so when was that? I think that was in St. Louis well, yeah. about three years, ago. three years ago. I was horrified. I was just horrified. It's like, what? Do, we're doing very controversial things. Had you thought about that? <laughs> if you get incorporated, there's some protections, not a lot, but there are some protections in the law. And I made the offer in St. Louis to do that for this organization. And I did it. And this organization's incorporated in California because that's where I'm licensed to practice law. And it has its tax exempt status from the Internal Revenue Service. So it has been done. And I will tell you that for anybody else here who wants to get an organization started, let me know. And I will give you all the paperwork. I won't necessarily fill it out for you, but I will show you. I will give you samples, which cut and paste works beautifully these days. I'll give it to you electronically, and you too can cut and paste. And so we, California RSOL, we are a 501C4. Anybody heard about C4s recently? It's been all in the news, right? And the IRS threw the brakes on. It took National RSOL an extra year to get its status as a C4 because of the mess at the IRS. And so I kind of chuckle when I hear about all the Tea Party organizations that got caught up in that net in the IRS. This national organization got caught in the same net, right? And that's why it took an extra year. I would call the IRS and be on hold for more than an hour to talk to a person who would say, it's just going to take more time. And the other thing is, if you call the IRS and bug them, then they give you something else to do. Okay, so I learned that lesson, don't bug the IRS. And eventually, this letter just popped out of nowhere, right, and said, congratulations. And by the way, it was backdated to the application date. So, okay, we'll take that. Um, so we are a C4 in California because we want to lobby. That's very, very important. A C3, there's this 10% rule, don't mess with that, okay? Because you can lose your tax exempt status if you lobby too much as a C3. So just get on with it. You start out as a C4, that's my strong recommendation. And then my other strong recommendation is, and then once you get your feet underneath you, <laughs> start a C3. And that's exactly what we did. So a year later in 2012, we started a foundation the name of our foundation does not have the word sex offender in it. It's called the Family Safety Foundation. Oh, yawn. What? You look at the, it has a website. It's really boring. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want it to be on anybody's radar screen. But the reason we set up the foundation is we had a couple people willing to make a $1,000 donation to California RSOL that said, if only you were a C3, I could add a zero. Cool. <laughs> it was worth it, OK? We have had two donations with five digits. And trust me, that is a very good feeling because it empowers you then to do the things that need to be done. Mm -hmm. We're in the process right now of 13 lawsuits. It's gonna to grow to 15 in the next week and a half. I think the, fifth, the 14th one is gonna be filed this week since I did the paperwork before I left. And, um, and we couldn't have done it without donations. And you never know where your donations are gonna come from. I'm, I'm absolutely serious about this. I talked to this father of a registrant one day, complete stranger phone call, you never know again, and I just listened. For 15 minutes I listened. Mostly I told him, we can't help you here, we can't help you there, oh yeah, here we can help you. I just listened for 15 minutes and then he was ready to go, I was like, thank you very much. 30 minutes later, literally, I got an email from his wife who I hadn't even spoken to, asking for our taxpayer identification number because they wanted to make a $10,000 donation to the organization. That was a 15 minute phone call. I was like, wow, Santa Claus showed up. You know? 
<laughs> and um, you just don't know what's going to happen. Another, our, our largest single donation was $25,000 from a family of a registered citizen. Now, I knew that family for more than two years, almost three. And the dad in the beginning was so reluctant. He was like, I can't, I'm so scared. I'm afraid to tell anybody. We have such shame in our family. You know, we were this law-abiding family. Nobody has ever been arrested or convicted of anything. And here our 31-year-old son, who was doing fantastically in his career as an international consultant or whatever he was, he downloaded two videos of teenagers, right? I call them frolicking teenagers. I've never seen the videos. But the fact is that before they knew it, before his son knew it, the front door took him away in handcuffs. You know, his son in Washington, D.C., had a wonderful career, master's degree, blah, 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 blah. It didn't make any difference. He downloaded two videos. And he was convicted of possession of child pornography and distribution of child pornography merely because he had opened up his computer to LimeWire. Please, if you do nothing else, tell people do not ever go to the LimeWire site. And do not ever open your computer to that because you will be charged with distribution as well as possession of child pornography even if, by the way, you've never opened anything up, a file folder, because you possessed it in your computer. And because of that experience, their son was sentenced to five years in federal prison. A kid who, I think, didn't even have a speeding ticket. I mean, this kid must have walked on water. <laughs> I have speeding tickets. But um, <laughs> the, f the, fact is, the fact is that never been arrested or convicted of anything. And I've been told that the judge apologized to the family and said, this is a mandatory minimum chastised the prosecutor for charging him with distribution because he didn't send those files to anybody, all right, but because he had the capability, once you open your computer up to LimeWire, you have the capability of distributing, he was charged with both. So that young man is now spending five years in prison. So this dad, who was so ashamed, um, about two years later was testifying before our state legislature. And telling about his son and his family. And it was really hard for this man to do it because he has a very high profile. And the only other time he'd ever been to our state capitol was to talk about car dealerships because he owns a car dealership. And so I remember I was in the very first time he came to Sacramento, he says, you know what, I don't know what I'm gonna do if I see somebody that I know. So of course that's what happened, right? Later that day we're walking down the street and there's his state senator. Hi, Bruce, what are you doing here? And Bruce just froze. <laughs> and he said, uh, I'm here on family business. <laughs> That's what he came up with right then. So two years later, this man's testifying, and he's on television. I mean, it, but it took him that long. But one of the things he did, this man, between, it was just between him and his son, he told his son, when you are released from prison, we aren't going to have the same laws when you go in. And I knew that. And what happened is we, as a board, and we have, again, two boards, we came together for the first time last December, the two boards face-to-face. -face. Normally, our meetings are on phone. And so some people had never even met each other in person, right? So it's like, you know, I think it's time. Let's get the two boards together. We're not sure what's gonna happen, but let's get these two boards together. And we all had some ideas and we bounced them off of each other and we came up with a plan. And our plan is we are gonna get rid of presence restrictions this calendar year. We've got almost 80 cities and about a dozen counties in California that have presence restrictions. And this has a huge chilling effect because we have 58 counties and we have over 200 cities, but the chilling effect is our registered citizens are afraid to go anywhere, anywhere in the state because they don't know. If I go on the beach here, I could get arrested. If I go to the dog park there, I could get arrested. There are no signs. There were no signs telling people where they could and couldn't go. So talk about caveat emptor. And by the way, if you made the wrong decision, you could be in jail for a year and they could fine you $1,000 or both, right? What, they're gonna put you in jail for walking your dog at the dog park? 
And there's some really nasty people out there, let me tell you, they, some of them are elected officials. <laughs> and so we went to one city that was going to, before they passed their presence restrictions, Santa Ana, California for the record. And Santa Ana, California, we were talking to them about this and our, the man who wrote the book, Plumber Frank, and his daughter who lived in Santa Ana at the time, she got up to testify and she said, if you pass this ordinance, I can't, take my dad with me when I walk my dog at the park. And that's an important thing that we do together when he comes to visit me, right? And this is what the vice mayor of that city said. She said, listen, honey, if it's between your family going to the park and my family going to the park, my family's going to the park and not yours. That's how personal that got. And you know what? When we sued the city of Santa Ana, it felt damn good. <laughs> <laughs> and when we receive their settlement check in a few days, it's going to feel even better. <laughs> <laughs> We've had other experiences like that. So, uh, so back to the point, please establish a 501c4 first, and then establish your 501c3 next. I have the templates, I will give them to you, I will give you free legal advice, <laughs> to take whatever you want of it and ignore the rest. You do need to get a board of directors together, it could be as few as three people, okay? You don't have to have a board of 25, in fact I advise against it, the more people you have on your board, the crazier things can get, okay? Again, we have monthly meetings, our boards have monthly meetings, they're by phone, we're all over the state. We do it by telephone. There's free conference call numbers these days. You call into that number, it doesn't cost anybody anything. And by the way, they'll even record them for you if you want. So whoever's taking the minutes can go back and listen, <laughs> just in case, like me, you don't get all the details the first time. Okay, it's a, they're wonderful uh, assets. We have monthly meetings in addition to that in person. And our monthly meetings in person, we are meeting with registered citizens and family members of registered citizens. And the reason we do that is education. So many people out there do not know what the current law is. They have no idea. I have people telling me, they told me I couldn't go to my granddaughter's graduation, high school graduation. I said, what? That's nonsense. Let me tell you how to do it, right? People. I've heard there's some way to get off the registry in California. There's two ways, by the way. One is completely theoretical, governor's pardon, because no governor has ever pardoned a sex offender. And we have another way called a certificate of rehabilitation, which is almost theoretical, but every once in a while somebody squeaks by, okay? I can tell them what the basic criteria are, and then I can refer them to another attorney who will actually do the work. Okay, I've done a couple myself and been successful, but it's a lot of work, and I'm too busy suing cities and counties, quite frankly, to take care of that. Okay, um, so what we're about as an organization, we're about education, so we educate our members, and by the way, we declare everybody who's on our registry to be a member. We have over 105,000 people on our registry, and our registry continues to grow. Very few people get off, and it's a lifetime registry for everybody. You peed in the park, side of the highway, doesn't make any difference, you're on our registry, okay? You're a 16 year old who, who took nude selfies and sent them to a couple boys at the high school for whatever reason, she's a registered sex offender, okay? We have a kid who was so excited, he graduated from high school, after his graduation he rips off his clothes and goes streaking, he's now a registered sex offender, okay? These are the people we have on our registry who are branded for the rest of their lives until and unless we get our tiered registry created. Okay, so that's education. We also educate the public, okay? And how do we educate the public? Newspaper articles, I got one here. This is lovely, this is free publicity. It says, Lompoc considers sex law changes, and they did. They repealed their ordinance, they repealed their presence restrictions, they put their residency restrictions on a stay of enforcement. They have formally agreed not to enforce the residency restrictions until our state Supreme Court makes up its mind. It's been sitting on a case for three and a half years. I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon. This is a significant victory. We have about a dozen transients in this city who I bet get to go home and live with their families now because they put the stay of enforcement. Okay, so that's education, including the media. I will talk to anybody. I've talked to 
oh my gosh, I've talked to Fox News, I've talked to some moron named Joe Pags, who is a stand-in for Glenn Beck. This man actually told his people on the radio that if you are committed any crime, you have no constitutional rights. <laughs> blink, 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 if you can blink on the radio. And he, he meant it. He meant it. So anyway, that's part of our public, our education of the public. Um, and, and I'll give you a real life example. I went on some shock jock radio show, and this guy was, he was armed. He was ready for me. He was just going to slash and burn, right? And, and during the 30 minutes, and we had live callers and everything, during the 30 minutes, he learned something that I said. He actually heard one thing that I said, which is not everybody on the registry is the same, okay? Not everybody is Jerry Sandusky, who is alleged to have raped a dozen kids. There are also people, the, the, the sexters, the streakers, etc. He learned that one thing, and at the end of the 30 minutes, he repeated that. He says, I learned one thing today. That man has had me on his radio show two more times. And he starts out the radio show now going, I learned one thing. <laughs> and he says this. I guess it's, it's a good thing for him, or it's a surprise to him oh that he God, learned anything. <laughs> but anyway, I was happy to be his teacher. Okay, So that's a wonderful example. And trust me, I got some negative phone calls, but our people called in too and got some positive ones. So OK, that's education. Then litigation. And even though I'm a lawyer, I am a reluctant litigator, and I believe in being fair. So when a city is considering passing an ordinance that's unconstitutional, we send them a letter. This is unconstitutional for the seven, next seven reasons, right? 